this is joint work uh, that I've done along with my two advisors, uh, Dan Jurafsky, he's in the Natural Language Processing Group at Stanford, and Yuri Leskovic, who is in uh, the Stanford Network Analysis Project. So the high-level theme of today's talk is all about the idea that there is a kind of universal bias in the way that people use positive or negative emotional language. And this may seem like somewhat of a strange idea and exactly why there could be such a bias, but it's actually something that's gained quite a bit of attention both in academia and also has been talked about uh, a reasonable amount in the media as well. So this is just uh, shows a few uh, images of some both coverage in the media and academia of this idea. So at the top, we have an ABC News article about the idea. It shows a study showing that negative words uh, dominate language. There is a 2015 paper uh, by Peter Dodds's group. This is in PNAS, uh, which talks about the idea that human language reveals a universal positivity bias. And then more recently, this is a 2016 uh, news article saying there's a new study shows the words we use actually re reflect our own awful reality. And really, what all of these uh, articles, these papers are talking about is this idea that negative language is more differentiated. Uh, and one way of looking at this and why sometimes people will say there's a positivity bias or a negativity bias is what it comes down to is there seems to be a general trend across a wide variety of languages that there are more positive tokens. So if you sample a text, you'll generally see more positive words, so especially more adjectives that tend to have positive sentiment. But if you look at the dictionary, there's a greater variety of negative lexical items. So there's more distinct negative types. We have a greater diversity of negative words. But if you sample a text, you tend to see more positive phrases. So this is sometimes called the idea of their language being more differentiated in its uh, negative sentiment. And this goes back uh, quite a long time. Uh, so there's a first study. There's a series of class classic psychological experiments. And so what was done was people were asked to rate between two antonym pairs, which of these were adjectives, say which of these adjectives do you feel is more positive? And generally, the member of that pair that was ranked as being more positive was much more frequent. And in a very related task, they asked these people in this study, they gave them just a list of adjectives, and they said, sort these into a list of positive ones and a list of negative ones. And generally, the list of negative adjectives ended up being about two times larger. So this idea that there's more unique negative words, but positive words tend to be more frequent. And there's been a number of follow-up studies on this idea. So there was a more recent study by Rosen et al. There was an interview-based study showed that this general trend seemed to hold across 20 different languages. And then even more recently, there's this Peter Dodds paper that I referred to in the last slide. And this was a similar study, but where they used crowdsourcing. So they used Mechanical Turk to show that overall, across 10 different languages, if you got people to rate the sentiment of different words, so how the connotation surrounding these words, uh, people really tend to rate more. The words that people rate as being positive tend to be much more frequent. And another interesting aspect of this is related to the idea of negative language being more differentiated is in a way negative language can be seen as a being a bit more almost complex. And by complexity here I mean this in kind of the most boring mathematical sense that negative language, when you see a negative word, it tells you more information about its context. So in particular David Garcia and his group, they looked at how much, if I see a, a word, how much does it help me predict the other words that are going to occur in that in the context, say in 10 words surrounding that word. And you can use this to compute the information content of a word. And they found across three different languages this consistent trend where negative words were a lot more informative about their context. So they carried a lot more information. Now, there are a variety of different theories for why this is this trend, uh, for why this trend exists across uh, a wide number of languages. So not just Indo-European languages as well, but it's been shown across a wide variety. Uh, so there's some cognitive theories. So there's one uh, well-known theory called the Pollyanna principle, which in its most basic form is just the idea that uh, positive information is easier to remember. This is an explanation for why there is uh, more positive tokens, why we see positive words are higher frequency. Uh, in a somewhat contradictory, but not entirely, uh, 
theory is this idea of this mobilization minimization uh, hypothesis, which in a very simple sense, the idea is just that negative events, because they have a big consequence for, say, survival um, in our evolution, they evoke a stronger cognitive and emotional response, which is why we have a greater diversity of negative words. And then distinct from these cognitive theories, there's also just the idea that maybe this asymmetry, this idea of negative language being more differentiated, uh, maybe that is just because there are a greater diversity of negative events in our lives, but positive events are more frequent. So this is just the in, kind of environmental theory, which is that really the reason why we see this asymmetry in positive versus negative language uh, is just a consequence of our environment. And this was uh, an idea advanced by Ruman et al. in a PNAS paper um, from 2016. And this was uh, the paper that was being referred to where our words reflect our own awful reality. So in this talk, I'm interested in this idea of there being an asymmetry in the way that people use positive versus negative language, but I'm particularly interested in the historical or diachronic mechanisms. So how does this asymmetry actually play out in the way that language changes over time? And I'm also interested in a very practical question, which is if there is this asymmetry, so if negative language is more differentiated and there's also some differences in how negative versus positive language changes over time, what are the consequences of that for doing sentiment analysis in NLP? So what are the consequences of that for when we're trying to actually measure the emotion or sentiment in a text? So starting with this idea of what are the kind of diachronic corollaries of negative differentiation, uh, a very reasonable hypothesis is that if we see that negative language is more differentiated, if it's more diverse, a very reasonable hypothesis would be that we would expect that negative words are more unstable in their meaning over time. So hypothesis, the specific hypothesis that I want to look into, is this idea that part of the explanation for why we have a greater diversity in our negative language is that negative words are much more unstable in their semantics, and they have faster rates of semantic change over time. So to look into this question, we of course have to have a way to measure the rate at which word meanings change over time. And this is a non-trivial thing because if we want to look at uh, linguistic change over time, some sorts of changes are relatively easy to look at. We can look at how spellings change, et cetera, just by looking at the surface form of a word, by looking at a large number of a, of a historical text. But if we want to actually measure the rate at which word meanings change, this is something that's a bit more difficult because semantic changes aren't apparent in just the surface form of a word. So historically, what people have done is they have inferred semantic change by looking at the context that words are being used in and doing really detailed case studies. And there's some really great work by, for example, Trogett and Dasher that uses these case studies in order to generalize and make statements about the general laws that govern uh, the way that word meanings evolve. But unfortunately, these case study-based approaches don't really scale to the sorts of questions that I want to answer here. And that's because if I want to actually make a statement about, say, negative words generally changing in their meaning at a faster rate than positive words, uh, we really want to be able to look at this for, say, thousands of different words to have enough statistical power to really be able to evaluate this hypothesis. So the technique that I'm going to use in order to actually measure word meaning change so that we can answer this hypothesis is I'm going to use an approach called word embeddings or statistical word embeddings in order to measure semantics and to measure semantic change. So the basic idea behind word embeddings, and I presume that quite a few people, especially people who do natural language processing, are familiar with the idea, but the intuition is that we want to represent a word, represent a word semantics as a vector so just a large vector that summarizes how often this word co-occurs with other words so in a small context window. And you can see the intuition behind this, for example, uh, by looking at the co-occurrence statistics, say, for a word like computer versus a word like apricot. So a word computer is going to co-occur with a lot of the same words that uh, the word information co-occurs with, whereas it's not going to co-occur with the same words that apricot co-occurs with. And by summarizing this in a vector that tells you about all the different co-occurrence counts, this can give us a statistical or kind of computational measure of a word's meaning or its semantics. 
and taking this to the diachronic or the historical setting, the basic idea of how we're going to measure semantic change over time is what we'll do is we'll take historical texts from a particular time period, say for 1920 and 1990, we'll build word vectors for these two different time periods, and then to measure the rate of meaning change, of semantic change for a word, we'll take that word's vector in those two different time periods and measure how much that vector has changed. And in particular, we'll use the cosine distance between these two vectors. Now, I mentioned this idea of word embeddings, and this is something that has been an area of very active research in how to actually represent word meaning using these embeddings. And people don't actually just use raw co-occurrence counts because they come with a number of drawbacks. And in particular here, we're going to look at three state-of-the-art popular embedding approaches that allow us to represent meaning kind of more efficiently than just using raw co-occurrence counts. So in particular, the first representation we look at, which we call the explicit representation because it's very high dimensional, is using what's called the positive pointwise mutual information. So the intuition here is every word is going to be represented by a vector where the dimension of this vector is the size of our entire vocabulary. And each entry in this vector gives the pointwise mutual information between this word and this context word in our vocabulary. So basically, every entry in this vector says, how much more than chance does this word co-occur with this context word? Now, this is a nice representation. Using this pointwise mutual information has a number of nice properties, and it controls for words absolute frequencies. But one downside of this approach is that the dimension of our vector is the size of our entire vocabulary. So we're summarizing a word based on how much it co-occurs with all other words. And this can be problematic for a number of reasons, because uh, these vocabulary sizes will usually be somewhere in the 10 to 100,000. So the two other approaches that we look at are one, which is using the singular value decomposition uh, in order to reduce the dimensionality of these PPMI vectors. So we're just using a matrix factorization approach in order to learn a low dimensional embedding from these PPMI embeddings. And then the final approach is the very well-known uh, word-to-vec algorithm, and in particular what's called the skip gram with negative sampling uh, algorithm. And this, I won't go into too much details, but the basic idea is with word-to-vec, we learn low-dimensional, so usually about 300-dimensional embeddings for each word, where these embeddings are optimized so that the dot product between two embeddings is high if they tend to co-occur together and small if they tend to not co-occur together. And this is optimized using stochastic gradient descent. And there's a very wide active research area in kind of improving this thing. And we're using kind of the current state of the art uh, tricks in order to speed this up and make this work. So just to give kind of a quick sanity check, this idea of actually measuring semantic change using these word embeddings is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, what I've shown here is this is a visualization of the change in meaning that we see for three words. Uh, this is using these word embedding approaches, in particular using the word to vec approach. And these are where we've learned uh, embeddings using data from the Google Books data set. So Google Books has about these days about 6% of all English books ever published uh, from around 1600 to uh, the 2000s. And this is looking at uh, the decade or the uh, looking at from 1900s up to the 2000s, and also we have some data back to 1850. So we can see on the left, this is the very well-known change in meaning for the word gay, and we can see that when we visualize how these words are moving through our semantic space, yep. Yeah. So you're using like the five grams of the two? Yes. Two? Yeah, so this, this is using the five grams, so when I say how much the word's co-occurring with other words in its context, it's just words two, two, words, two words before and after which is important. It's a limitation of the Google Books data set in that it only gives you five grams. So, uh, But yeah, so we can see uh, the very well-known shift in meaning for the word gay. So in the 1900s, it was similar to things like uh, daft or flaunting or sweet and cheerful. And then you can see over time, it's moved in our semantic space to being very close to words related to homosexuality. Uh, and then in the middle, this is a very interesting shift because I actually didn't know that this was a thing until I was looking in this data. And this is the word broadcast, which historically actually used to refer to the casting out of seeds and then became associated with the casting out of the circulation of newspapers, the throwing of newspapers, and then gained this modern meaning of just meaning disseminating information. 
And then on the far right, there's another well-known example of what's called, this is actually pejoration. Uh, so this is a word that kind of became more negative over time. So the word awful originally actually just literally meant full of awe. And then over time, it has shifted to its more modern meaning of something being terrible or horrible. And you can see that in the 1990s, it's also close to things like wonderful and weird. And this is both due to the fact that awful is used a lot in informal language and also a minor issue with these word embeddings where they sometimes have trouble with antonyms. So things that are totally opposite tend to co-occur in similar places. Yes. Um, um, books coming in, it's like the that just because the, the, the composition of the literature is changing, that changes the meaning of the word. But if you, if you just limited like to some fiction or something, would you see the same? Actually, yes. So this, you do see a similar just limiting on fiction. And this is a really important point. So for historical linguistics and diachronic studies, Google Books is a great resource, but it also has a lot of downsides. And this genre shift over time is one of those big downsides. So we're always here, this is showing the full Google Books corpus, but we're always going to replicate our results using the full Google Books, Google Fiction, as well as another data set I'll introduce in just a minute, but I'll talk about it now, which is what's called the Corpus of Historical American English from Brigham Young University, which is about two orders of magnitude smaller. So the Google Books, has in the most recent decades about a billion words, say in the late 1990s, whereas this COA corpus is balanced over time, but only has about 20 million words per decade. So there's trade-offs. Uh, you get you know, clean data versus big data. And generally, we like to see that our results hold in both of those settings. And an interesting point on that is one of the good examples of how you can be misled is if you look at the plain Google Books corpus and you look at what words have changed a lot, uh, one of the ones that comes up is the word guy, and that's because of the Guy-Lussac law, which is a law in physics, I believe. I'm actually not entirely certain, but it just was in a lot of scientific publications at one point in time. And because of that, it, it, you get this, when you look at the neighborhood, its neighborhood becomes dominated by the word Lussac. Uh, and you're like, what is that? And it's just some, and Google Books is not even a, for scientific literature, it's somewhat random what gets in there and what doesn't. I never heard of this law. So those kind of things you have to be very careful about. And that's why I will always look both at Google Books and especially this clean Koha corpus. Um, cool. Stephen, and how do you deal with the um, disambiguate words? Example, disambiguate? Awful. Oh. Example, awful uh, at the moment can be applied to both senses very well, like horrible and terrible, and also wonderful. I see. So we didn't do explicit disambiguation between the different senses of a word. Uh, we, did, we did replicate things where we only looked at lemmas, lemma, which is going kind of the other way. Mm -hmm. And we also looked at things where we looked at words uh, and which part of speech they were being used in. So we looked at that granularity. So we did disambiguation by part of speech, and we also did more coarse grain at the lemma level. But we didn't actually do word sense disambiguation. And part of the reason why is because word sense disambiguation is a challenging task on its own. And introducing that as another kind of piece in the in another level in the pipeline led to quite a lot of complications. But finding a good way to integrate this issue of there being words having a variety of senses with change over time is quite important. Because one of the things I won't talk about in detail today, but one of the things we did find, especially in our initial work, is words that have a lot of different senses tend to change a lot faster. And part of that is because just by nature of having a lot of senses, you're used in a greater diversity of ways. So you're going to have more unstable word embeddings. So one of the big future directions is how to disentangle these kind of rates of change, especially for highly polysemous words. It can be quite complicated. But here, we're, not, we're just treating here for the, most of this talk for simplicity. A word is just going to be, we're not going to deal with part of speech. We're just, awful is just the string of letters A-U-F-U-L. Um, yeah. Do you understand whether the spatial is speech? Oh, very good question. Yes, so this is a complicated, when you're trying to make these visualizations, in reality, everything is changing. Uh, so this is actually showing the background is the 1990s background. And in the code, I'll, I'll have links to the code at the end. And in the code, 
we allow you to switch which background you want to show, and I have a variety of other visualization options uh, that you can play around with. But it's actually visualizing something where the whole space itself is shifting in a static visualization is somewhat challenging. And, and we thought that since people today speak in 1990s semantics, that the 1990s background would be probably the most informative. Um? Just, just a quick question. How, how many words do you need to make one of these words effects things give sensible results or interpretable results. So how large does the corpus how have to be? I would say that at minimum on the order of 10 million. Wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's, and I think that, that so there have been recent improvements. So uh, improvements in a, so one of the most interesting areas where there's been improvements is in one of the things I'm doing is I'm just separately considering each chunk of the corpus, so each decade here. And those are each separate corpora. And I'm learning vectors independently for each of them. And then there's some complications with aligning them that I won't get into, but we can talk about after. But more recently, following up on this work, there's been some really nice uh, papers that have tried to kind of smooth in between the different time periods, especially using different Bayesian approaches that are somewhat similar to topic models. And these approaches seem to be a lot more able to deal with small corpus sizes. So pe just naive word to vec, I would say you should have at least 100 million words to really have it be work well. Um, but these approaches seem to be able to work more in the range of million, hundreds of thousands, which is part of the reason why it's somewhat unfortunate that most of this study is really only on May 1850 forward because there just isn't enough text prior to that. But it's really, I'm really looking forward to actually trying out some of these more recent sm smoothed improvements on this that could hopefully handle smaller data sets. OK, so that was, I guess, just a qualitative visual sanity check that these things do make some sense. But we also looked at this in uh, a more quantitative way as well. So, First thing we did was we did what we called a detection task. And this is where we said, do these embeddings that we learn actually detect changes that we have known that have happened? So what we did was we went in the literature and found 28 expert attested shifts, so semantic changes that people had talked about in the literature. So for example, gay and homosexual moving closer together, uh, fatal and lethal moving closer together, um, broadcast and seed drifting further apart. And we expect that. In our model, if our model's good, it should say that these changes actually did happen. And in particular, there should be a statistically significant change point in these pairs. And we compared this for these various different methods. And generally, what we found, and this is, again, this is using the really big Google Books data set and then the really small, or quite small um, corpus of historical American English. And what we found was on the very large data set, this word to vec approach, which is really optimized for very big data sets, did the best. Uh, whereas on the smaller data set, it had been kind of flipped. And here, actually, this SVD-based approach uh, did the best. And this is a trend we found overall, not just in this work, but elsewhere, that generally this word to vec approach is really, really good for very large data sets. But on smaller data sets, just using um, pointwise mutual information combined with singular value decomposition, SVD, actually tends to do a little bit better. And we don't have a good theoretical explanation for this, but this is a very consistent trend. So the flip side of saying, do these methods detect shifts we knew happened is, well, are the shifts that they detect sensible? So now we look at this, what we call the discovery task. So here, what we did was for the various different methods, uh, we said, what are the top 10 words, top 10 shifts between the 1900s and the 1990s? And then uh, Dan, uh, Dan Duraski, my advisor, and I independently, we had to rate these words as being true bona fide semantic shifts, where we had to provide some sort of argument using the Oxford English Dictionary mostly, that this was actually something that happened. We had borderline cases where a word kind of may have shifted in usage, but we couldn't, it, it, it was somewhat on the border or we disagreed. And then we had things that were obviously just noise. So here we found that the uh, word to vec method was by far the best. Uh, this is only showing things for the Google Books Fiction data set. And we can see for the PPMI method, which is this method where we're representing words with these really high dimensional vectors, uh, this has a lot of issue with discourse words. So it thinks that words that are just used a lot change a lot. Uh, words that just occur in a lot of different 
discourse context, especially discourse markers and words that you would use in dialogue. So it gets very misled. And this has to do with the fact that just this really high dimensional vector has a lot of noise. Uh, there's also some issues that don't show up too much here because we tried to clean out proper nouns. But another issue with all these data sets, and especially the Google Books data set, is things like company names or publisher names can really start to mess things up. So we tried our best to clean those things out, get rid of all proper nouns. But Harry stayed in there because Harry actually has a verb usage. Uh, so, but Harry changed a lot because of its usage as a proper noun. So this is an unfortunate, we could have been more strict, I guess, and included anything that had any proper noun usage. So just to summarize the main findings from this empirical comparison, when we're trying to justify in a way that uh, these things do work, we basically found that overall, these things seem to, to be sensible. They do give us reasonable measurements of semantic change over time. Um, the SVD-based approach seems better for these smaller data sets. The word to vec approach was much more robust, especially on these large data sets. And both of them were a lot better than just using these raw pointwise mutual information vectors. And before we return to really kind of end this technical aside and return to the main task of actually trying to look at whether negative words change faster than positive words, one important basic trend to mention that we found with these is that when we're measuring rates of semantic change with word embeddings like this, one of the kind of biggest effects we see is that high frequency words tend to change at a slower rate than low frequency words. And there's both a some evidence that, so this is both due to there being some statistical artifacts where words that occur a lot, we get more robust estimates of their semantics. So they look like they change less. But even we tried really hard to control for that. And there seems to also be a real effect where words that have really high usage tend to be more stable in their semantics. And there's also some psychological evidence and, psychologi and other studies that have give some support to this. But this is important because when we want to measure semantic change over time, especially when we're using these word vector approaches, we really need to be aware of the fact that frequency is an extremely strong confounding variable. OK, so with that technical uh, aside out of the way, now we can get back to the main goal, which is to actually estimate whether or not negative words are changing faster in their meaning than positive words. And now that we, now that we can compute rates of semantic change using these word vectors, uh, we can compute them for a large number of words. But in order to see whether or not there's a relationship between these rates of semantic change and how positive or negative words are, we also need some measure of the sentiment of a word. And we also need this measurement over time as well. And then once we have this, of course, it's relatively straightforward to see you know, whether or not there is a strong relationship between these things, which, of course, we'd want to check only after controlling for frequency. So I won't go into too much detail on how we actually measure a word sentiment over time. Uh, this is actually another research paper on its own. Uh, but the issue is that when we want to see whether or not there's an interaction between rates of semantic change and a word sentiment, the issue is that both of these things are changing over time. So we can measure the change. But now to measure a word sentiment, uh, we have a similar issue that word sentiment shift. So for example, there's the word terrific, uh, which used to have a negative meaning and now has a positive meaning. There's a large number of these examples. And so what we do here is we actually use a somewhat similar technique to how we did to measure word meaning, to measure word sentiment. What we did was we found a number of stable seed words. So we, by Looking at the Oxford English Dictionary and historical texts, we found a set of words that were strongly negative or strongly positive and had had stable sentiment for the last 150 years. So for example, the word hate has been pretty negative, although at the end, I'll show that it still has somewhat interesting usage in modern Twitter. Uh, but what we do is after finding these seed words, we look at how much all words co-occur with these seed words. And we do this in a technique where we build a network based on word co-occurrence. And we're going to take these seed words and run random walks. So if we had a word love is, say, a positive seed word. And we'll run random walks on these networks which connect words based on how much they co-occur. And a word sentiment score is going to be proportional to how often it's visited on these random walks. 
And this, we did a bunch of validation uh, using a number of known lexicons. And this is currently the state of the art for trying to induce sentiment when we only have a small number of seed words. So using this, we can actually measure our changing sentiment over time. So now that we have both measurements of how fast words' meaning are changing and what words' sentiments are over time, we can then use these things to see whether or not there truly is a relationship between the rate at which a word's meaning changes and how positive or negative that word is. And here, I'm going to focus on our results on the Google Books Fiction corpus, uh, again, because the main Google Books corpus has some big issues, the scientific literature. And we are currently replicating things on Koha, but things are a little bit more complicated there because the small corpus size is really starting to um, give us some problems, be a bit of a thorn in our side. But what we'll do is we'll take our estimated historical word sentiment scores, we'll take our estimated historical rates of semantic change, and then we're going to put these all into a mixed effects model to try to measure whether or not there's a significant relationship between a word sentiment and how fast its meaning is changing. And we're going to do this controlling for a word's frequency, a score for how polysemous that word is, and also controlling for the time period. And we use a mixed model because we have multiple measurements for each word. So we're going to cluster things according to words. So we're going to measure, say, a word might have a measurement in five different decades. And since those things are correlated, we have to control for that. And the current preliminary results, again, because this is just on the Google Books fiction corpus, and we really want to extend this to a large number of data sets, is we do find that even after controlling for frequency, uh, there is a significant negative relationship between a word's sentiment score and its rate of semantic change. So in particular, if we have a one standard deviation decrease in sentiment score, this is about a 0 0.01 uh, increase in standard deviation increase in the word's rate of semantic change. And it's, again, important to emphasize that the this is after controlling for frequency and for polysemy. If we don't do these controls, there's actually a really strong relationship because negative words tend to be less frequent. So already, as kind of a baseline effect, we do see that negative words change faster just as a consequence of them being lower frequency. But even after controlling for that, this effect still seems to hold. And so just to summarize, we found that this diachronic corollary of negative differentiation, this idea that negative words change at a faster rate, uh, does seem to hold, at least in these preliminary experiments. And the next steps is we really want to look at more data sets with more languages especially. Uh, and one other thing that I'm also looking into doing is right now we have this complication where we have a computational linguistic measure of how fast a word's meaning is changing a computational linguistic measure of the word sentiment over time, and we're correlating these two derived measures. And it's a lot of moving parts, and it can be a bit difficult, because I mean both our independent and our dependent variable are derived in this case. And it can be a little bit convoluted, and so one of the things that we want to do, especially for the sentiment score, is we want to make sure that these results hold even when we use an alternate, like a measure of sentiment that's not also derived from co-occurring statistics. And what we're planning to do here is by scraping uh, dictionaries, online dictionaries, so things like Wiktionary and the Oxford English Dictionary, and looking for when words have attested pejorative usages. Uh, so pejorative usages are a, very, a subset of negativity, uh, but it's something that's often attested in dictionaries. So we're hoping that using this other from a totally different source and somewhat less convoluted, we hope to replicate these results. So, so far, the entire talk has been about the historical aspects of negative differentiation, or this idea of there being a negative semantic instability. And we did find some preliminary evidence that there is a diachronic corollary to uh, this idea of there being negative differentiation. And I believe there's some really interesting theoretical connections here between this idea of information content I mentioned earlier and non-literal usage and these words having higher rates of semantic change. Uh, but also, as an NLP practitioner, this idea that negative language is more differentiated and also potentially more unstable over time, I also think possibly has some pretty important implications for NLP practice and in particular for sentiment analysis. So, very quick background, sentiment analysis is 
this task that's very popular in natural language processing where we're trying to predict the sentiment or the affect or the emotion in a text. And what we'll do is we'll take often like a review or a tweet and then we'll use some statistical technique in order to estimate whether or not this is positive or negative or sometimes neutral. And this is a very active research area within natural language processing. And there's a large number of very complicated approaches uh, that have been proposed for this using things like deep learning and other very fancy machine learning architectures. However, when you actually look at what people use in practice, especially what's being used in industry and what's being used by computational social science researchers, what they do is they count positive and negative words from off-the-shelf dictionaries. So you take a text, you have some dictionary of ex example positive and negative words, and then the score you assign a document is just some, say, average of how much positive versus negative words they are. Sometimes you control for negation. But this is very, very common practice throughout both academia and industry. So my hypothesis is that if it's true that negative language is more diverse, if it's true that negative language changes at a faster rate over time, then the implication for sentiment analysis is that negative lexicons should be less trustworthy. So if negative words are changing in their meaning faster, they're going to become obsolete. If negative language is more complicated, more diverse, these are going to be less good indicators of sentiment. So our little experiment to test whether or not this is the case is we're going to look at the precision of words in off-the-shelf lexicons. So there's a large number of popular lexicons or dictionaries where people have lists of positive and negative words or words with scores of how positive and negative they are. And we want to see what proportion of utterances or sentences containing these words, say if we take a word like a negative word like hate that's in almost every single one of these lexicons, how often is a tweet that contains the word hate that contains the word hate actually rated as negative by uh, a crowdsourcing worker. And the data we're going to use for this is this is a data set of 21,000 tweets that have been rated by five Mechanical Turk crowd workers each. And they are rated into either being uh, neutral, positive, or negative. And interestingly, you can see here, uh, this is just a, it's a sample of tweets. And you can see this idea of there being kind of positive language being more frequent plays out here as well, where we ended up with 8,000 positive and 2,000 negative. And then we're going to look at some off-the-shelf lexicons. So these are dictionaries of positive and negative words. One of these is expert constructed. It was made for consumer sentiment analysis. So it has 2,000 positive words and about 5,000 negative words. And again, you can see the negative differentiation here where they've come up with a lot more negative words than positive words. And then the other lexicon we're going to look at is the, what's called the Warner lexicon. And this is crowdsourced. So we have an expert constructed and a crowdsourced, and they've assigned uh, 40,000 word scores, uh, crowd workers were asked how positive or negative is this word, and we've only kept the really positive or really negative words. Oh, oh there we go. So uh, the experiment we're going to conduct is we're going to compute the precision of all the words in this lexicon or in these lexicons. So what we want to look at is for every one of these words that occurred more than five times in, distinct, in five distinct tweets, say a negative word like hate, how often were the tweets that it occurred in actually rated as being negative? And interestingly, we found that for both of these lexicons, the positive words were much higher precision than the negative words. So interestingly, and this is a relatively naive sentiment analysis where we're just kind of seeing the indicator of a single word, but still, we found that only 30% of the time when one of these negative words occurred was that tweet actually labeled as being negative by the crowd workers. Whereas in contrast, uh, more than 60% of the time and 77% of the time for the Warner lexicon was a tweet actually labeled positive when a positive word occurred. And here, this breaks this down. This is a histogram of the precisions for these different words. So you can see on the left is the negative lexicon items. And you can see that there's a lot of them. So for this Warner lexicon, this crowdsourced, there's a large number, around 25, that have basically no precision at all. That basically, they're words that people think are really negative, but they just aren't great indicators of sentiment at all. And to give some sense of what this actually looks like, because uh, we were quite surprised at how strong this effect really was, is we looked at the word hate, which has a precision of only 30 in this data set. Uh, and we wanted to see, well, how is it actually being used? 
and interestingly, it's being used in a lot of these almost they're non-standard non-standard usages or constructions, but are now have become quite standard. And I think my favorite one is this one in the middle, which this says, "I hate John for making me watch the Kurt Cobain documentary because I'll end up listening to Nirvana all day tomorrow." So this is. It doesn't really hate John. This is not a negative usage. This is neutral or maybe positive. But you can see that the word hate isn't actually a good indicator of this being negative. And then some of the other ones are slightly less interesting, like love or hate them. We could pretty easily deal with that. Or as much as I may hate, you can think that we could learn to discount these sorts of hedging statements. But overall, what's quite interesting is in addition to finding this diachronic trend where we found that negative language tends to change at a faster rate than positive language, there also seems to be an important consequence of this for natural language processing today, which is that negative lexicons are a lot less trustworthy. Negative language, as a consequence of the fact that it's you know, more unstable in its usage, that negative language is more differentiated, a consequence of that seems to be that off-the-shelf sentiment lexicons, negative off-the-shelf sentiment lexicons are very low precision. And this is an important thing because these sentiment lexicons are being used to or buy stocks and make all kinds of um, decisions automatically. And it's pretty bad that, say, a word like hate only has 30% precision uh, in doing this sort of task. So that summarizes uh, kind of the current preliminary work. And I should say that this is uh, most of this work, uh, besides the work on actually measuring uh, semantic and sentiment change, is still an in progress and somewhat preliminary. So comments and feedback are really appreciated. And there's code um, both for the historical word embeddings, for visualizing them, and for the historical sentiment, and also some induced historical sentiment lexicons, which is available uh, at these different URLs. Thanks. <laughs>